This is CSAP's Science and Policy Podcast from the University of Cambridge, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policy making. Welcome back to the fourth episode in CSAP's Science Policy Podcast um, series looking at genetic technologies. In the first three episodes, we've looked at genome editing and its potential to contribute to food security and agriculture and its role potentially in biodiversity conservation and some of the public regulatory political debates that are happening and we can expect to happen. In the final episode, we're going to turn to the question of genetic technologies and human health. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Alison Hall, who's a lawyer and a nurse and leads work at the PhD Foundation on Regulation and Ethics. PhD Foundation is a, is a think tank that's part of the University of Cambridge looking at genomics and public health. Alison, you're very welcome. John Roberts, um, who's a researcher at the Sanger, uh, looking at society and ethics research at the Sanger Institute, and also works as an NHS genetic counsellor at Adam Brooks Hospital. And uh, Sarah Franklin, who's a professor of sociology at Cambridge, whose work looks at the sociology, the anthropology of uh, reproductive technologies and genetic technologies, um, and leads the ReproSoc, a research group that looks at reproduction as, a, as an object of inquiry and as a, a way of living. And Sarah, it's very nice to see you too. Thanks, Rob. So I'm, I begin by asking you, Alison, if that's all right, just to say something about what the current state of, of regulation and use of genetic technologies in, in, in human healthcare is in the UK at the moment. And what's the best way into thinking about this question? Rob, you, you're asking about um, genetic technologies. So um, that's there's a whole host of different technologies that are being used um, within healthcare and within medical research. Um, there's a big drive within government to widen the use of a particular form of, of genetic technology, whole genome sequencing, um, which is able to look in detail at individual genomes and use that information to generate faster diagnoses for patients and also more targeted treatments. I guess there are some other technologies too, and they are gene editing technologies. Yeah, and I mean, that, Alison, that, that would be particularly building on the conversation we've had in the first three episodes where people have talked about this real kind of emergence over the last few years of, of genome editing, the use of CRISPR-Cas9 in the laboratory and the huge kind of potential that seems to have opened up. So it'd be very interesting to know, you know what use that, or what discussions have happened around the use of that in, in human health. The discussions around um, gene editing, they're very sharply divided as to uh, in, in relation to um, whether you're using them for reproductive purposes, so to um, edit the germline, or whether you're using them as a treatment. So that's somatic gene editing. And in a sense, the ethical issues that follow from each use and the regulatory environment depends on three elements. So I'm sure in, in your previous talks, you, you, you covered the fact that gene editing has a guidance element, a cutting element, and also a delivery element. And so there are features of each of those three dimensions of gene editing that are relevant, both in germline and in, in somatic gene editing. And in germline gene editing, the ethical issues that arise are partly worries that you shouldn't be using these techniques at all because you're uh, of the impact on the individual, but also the individual on populations. In somatic gene editing, the, the, the concerns are more around the safety and the effectiveness of the gene editing techniques, that they're not safe enough or that they have impacts on other bits of the genome. So in terms of the regulatory regime in the UK at the moment, you know, what is possible in, in, in terms of using or testing genome editing for either germline or, or somatic uses? For germline gene editing, the techniques are very closely regulated by the Human Fertilisation and Embryology um, Authority and the ACT, and they 
only allow um, research to be done in, in a very tightly regulated set of circumstances that I think we might go on to discuss in more detail later. In somatic gene editing, the issues are slightly different um, in that the technologies are generally as part of a sort of clinical trial. And so the issues there are having a prescribed clinical trial where you can monitor the impact of the technology on the individual. I'd love to come back, Alison, to you to talk about the kind of the regulatory debates. Do we feel the regulatory arrangements are kind of adequate at the moment? Where are, are there ways in which their kind of boundaries are being pushed or tested at the moment? But before doing that, I wonder if it'd be helpful to have some sort of concrete examples. And I don't know, maybe John, if you could, if you'd be the person to give us some sort of concrete examples about, you know, in, in both the germline case and the somatic case about where these technologies are currently being used or where there's the debate about the potential to use them. And then we'll come back, Alison, to ask you about the regulatory kind of fitness for, for managing those. John, could you have any specific examples where you can illustrate this? Sure. So um, there's a number of different areas in medicine where people are thinking about using um, sort of gene editing technologies. Um, in particular, um, there'd be um, some successes in ophthalmology, so um, sort of inherited retinal diseases, where gene editing technologies have been used to kind of correct the faulty gene that causes an inherited retinal condition. And there's a number of different areas where this technology, so when we're talking about somatic um, editing, in this case, it would be using technologies to alter the genes, but, you know, the, the aim would be to only change um, the genes that are kind of in the retina as opposed to uh, changing the genes that you're kind of born with or inherited, which is what you're talking about with germline. And there's a number of different disease areas where um, this form of gene therapy is being used with um, increasing amounts of success. But there's a cautious approach, both in terms of uh, making sure that this is safe and also there are technical complications that mean that, you know, for, for a number of inherited conditions, gene editing is either not yet possible or, or kind of increasingly complicated. So from a kind of clinical point of view, part of the challenge is also managing patient expectations. Um, so, so that you know, you're you're honest about the fact that research is exciting and there's huge benefit, but at the same time, um, not not over promising. I think. And in terms of the germline um, arguments about using this technology for what we call germline genome editing, you know, what are the sort of cases being made that this is something that should be considered? I think the case for germline editing is is different. Um, so, if you have a known inherited condition in the family, there are already a number of ways that you can access technologies to stop that being passed on to the next generation if that's what you want. So there's prenatal genetic testing, which is testing in a pregnancy. Um, there's also something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is a form of IVF, but with um, a PGD, the embryos have uh, testing first, genetic testing first, um, and only those without the known uh, condition that, um, are then used for, for implantation. So there are already a number of technologies available for people who you know who, who wish to um, have a child who doesn't have the genetic condition in the family so germline editing I guess could then be used if you've got an embryo there might be some you know rare circumstances with PGD for example if you're you know, doing IVF where you have an embryo and none are suitable for implantation because they all say for example just by chance carry the gene alteration that causes the condition in the family germline editing I guess then could technically be used to you know, um, modify those embryos so that they don't have the alteration. The PGD is only available for, uh, uh, again, regulated by the HFEA, um, sort of known sort of severe genetic conditions, and it's potential that germline editing could be a more subtle tool because essentially with PGD, you're just testing for is this gene alteration present or not. It's technically possible, I guess, thinking about kind of in the future for germline editing to be used to, to sort of, you know, for, for um, editing multiple genes. There's a kind of a wider scope, um, but there's no talk about that yet, and that obviously, you know, starts to pose some more complicated and broader ethical questions. I mean, you, you, you spend time in, in a hospital setting uh, as a genetic counsellor. Do you, do you find people come to you with questions, you know, that are about what's possible and kind of hopes that, that, that you have to then discuss in terms of this genome editing, which clearly in the laboratory has opened up huge possibilities that, that seemed, you know, unthinkable a, a decade ago? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there are often two points at which people are talking about the, the hopes and possibilities of genome editing. I think one is the point at diagnosis. So um, if, let's say, someone um, is 
we'll stick with ophthalmology because we've been there. Someone might then say be having some problems with their sight and then they get a genetic diagnosis of an inherited retinal condition, so something like retinitis pigmentosa, um, which you know at the minute is currently uh, progressive and incurable. Um, and at that point, people are thinking, you know, you know, okay, what's the hope here? What, what, what are the what are the possible therapeutic options? So that's what one point at which people start to, um, you know, want to talk about genome editing. A another point often is when they are trying to make decisions about, you know, family planning. In those circumstances, it's a kind of discussion around what might be different for their children. Um, so, you know, if they're thinking about having children and they're trying to decide whether or not to use genetic testing to inform family planning, one of the questions they're going to be asking is, where are the therapeutics? What, what's going to be available for my children in 5, 10, 20, 30 years' time? And again, that's what, you know, a point where you might, might start having a conversation about, the, you know, the potentials of genome editing. And in those circumstances, it's a very, you know, important uh, kind of conversation to make sure that you're balancing the kind of hope that is coming with genome editing with a realistic appraisal, appraisal of the uncertainty about what might be available for them. Okay, thank, thanks, John. That, that's very helpful to sort of make real some of these kind of discussions that are taking place and, and what sort of therapies are available or possible. But Alison, you know, how, how does in, in the UK the regulatory framework cope with some of these possibilities I mean, do you feel that it's to use the phrase fit for purpose or does it need re-looking does it need re-examining in the light of, of new technical possibilities so i think again we need to make the distinction between germline gene editing and somatic gene editing in germline gene editing i th i think there's there's been the concern that because it's potentially um, irreversible that there are a whole host of ethical issues that need to be considered and, for example, the Nuffield Council on Bioethics published a report in 2018 which strongly made the case that three factors would need to be met, that there would need to be broad and inclusive um, societal debate and robust governance put in place um, before germline gene editing was, was contemplated, that there would need to be standards for clinical safety, and we've already touched on that for individuals um, having gene editing. And then also the risks of adverse effects for individuals, groups, and society as a whole have been assessed. So they led the way, I think, um, along with the National Academies um, in, in the US for creating this strong governance around germline gene editing. That was all sort of blown apart, really, by um, Dr. He uh, and the publicity around um, a Chinese doctor who um, had used germline gene editing uh, in a Chinese case of twins. And there was an international outcry following his case and a number of calls that there were moratoria uh, global moratoria on any sort of germline gene editing. And at that stage within the, the UK, it looked as if we had a, quite a permissive stance to, to germline gene editing because of the pre-existing infrastructure that the HFEA had. So the, the HFEA is, has issued some licenses for um, research on embryos uh, if they're less than 14 days old. And so I think in the UK, we've been seen to have quite a proportionate and robust regulatory environment for germline gene editing, but there are still concerns about other countries. Thank you. And, and finally, Alison, on, on somatic um, uses of, of, let's say, um, you know, technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, what, what's the current regulatory framework there? Um, with with somatic gene editing, the situation is a little bit unclear just post Brexit, um, in that the UK has stepped back from implementing the clinical trials regulation and the medical devices regulation that are being implemented in the EU. The Medicines and Medical Devices Act has just been passed. It had royal assent on the 11th of February, and that creates a mechanism for the UK government to make more flexible and dynamic regulations in a number of different areas. And I suspect that they will be making some, some regulatory changes for these sorts of therapies in the future. That's very, help very helpful, Alison. I'd like to turn to Sarah Franklin now, because, you know, as you point to, Alison, there's, there's a, a moment we're living through in the UK at the moment where both we're seeing the technological possibilities through genome editing apparently open up. And of course, the UK is thinking about 
what place it wants to occupy in the kind of global regulatory space. And obviously there are some arguments made that you know one of the advantages of going it alone is that it does create opportunities for kind of regulatory innovation and, and thinking different. And so I'm really interested to hear from Sarah about a slightly longer view. You know, what what is the sort of social and, and technological context in which some of these discussions are taking place? Is it best to think of it in in the in the run of IVF and the development of in vitro fertilization or in other kinds of genetic technologies and genomic sciences? How, how best do we think about this moment? Um, well, I think that's a really good question, Rob, because as Alison mentioned in 2019, Dr. He in China unveiled um, his work that he'd done to modify the HIV-related gene, which has been target for gene editing, a hypothetical target for gene editing for quite some time, um, the susceptibility to transmission of HIV. And when he revealed his work, he compared himself to Robert Edwards, who also famously, um, along with Patrick Steptoe, you know, took a relatively controversial decision to pursue IVF without any clear regulatory framework in 1978 when Louise Brown was born in Oldham. And so I do think that history is very useful for us to think about gene editing as it has been, to think about pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and mitochondrial donation and cloning and, and this history of dialogue accompanied by robust legislation um, is very distinctive to the UK. No other country has that kind of legislative infrastructure. And, and the way that came about through the combined efforts of, of Anne McLaren, the biologist um, who was based at Cambridge in the later part of her life, and, and Mary Warnock, who sadly passed away recently, is a history of arguing that if people are, in effect, entrusted with decent information about the science, and if the scientific community really makes an effort, as, as John was saying, to communicate with people, and, and if there is a high level of transparency, and if the limits to the use of technology are, are credible, and in the case of IVF, those limits were backed up by criminal law, which seemed to some people quite an extreme measure to take. But the Warnock decision to establish the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority through the Act in 1990 was essentially based on an exchange. In exchange for allowing embryo research, as well as IVF, those techniques would be subject to a very high degree of specialist standalone surveillance and licensing, and that would be backed up by criminal law. And that that arrangement, that exchange, that social contract, if you will, has been unusually long-lived. That legislation has been revisited, it's been amended, it's been reenacted, and the HFEA has arguably been a very successful policy innovation here in the UK that has created a very distinctive climate for innovation that is on the one hand extremely strict and on the other hand extremely permissive. Um, so the question of what's going to happen with CRISPR is very, very important. It's a really, really important question because it's by far the most powerful translational biomedical technology we've seen, and it's being commercialized at a rate of knots. Um, and the most important comparison is the fertility industry. And if we look at what's happening in the fertility industry right now, which my research group is doing, um, you know, it's very concerning what's happening in the fertility industry right now because there's a huge expansion, a huge capitalization of sort of global mega brands. And there's a lot of kind of pseudo scientific provision of IVF add-ons and so forth. And this will weaken public confidence. And we've, COVID has been a very helpful instruction and <laughs> a lesson in the need for robust public confidence in the health services. If CRISPR-Cas9 is gonna come along, if somatic gene editing, if, um, new forms of fertility treatment involving monitoring of the genomes of embryos, which is basically underway, you know, it's gonna, require a very robust level of 
public confidence in the legislation. And, and my concern, my concern is that the fertility industry is not giving us a terrific example of what that looks like. That's great. Well, John, come in. I've got several questions, but John, you've got one question here. I, I, I think that is where the difference, you know, between, say, this kind of somatic germline comes into play and where um, potentially the, the issues around germline testing um, are so different. Um, because if you take the current technology, which is PGD, um, partly you're kind of limited by the HFEA with their definition of, you know, serious condition, but also by the fact that you're, you can only really test for the presence of, say, you know, what, what one of you know, the gene changes is already known. Um, as ge genomic technology increases and we start to find the genetic basis of more kind of complex disorders, you know, you also then have the potential to use that genome editing technology in a way that is... Um, you know, widely expanded. And I think it's, as Sarah alluded to, it's, it's how do you create a robust framework um, so that that isn't then used in inappropriate ways, especially in terms of, you know, people who are offering these technologies. For example, it's possible to say or conceive of a, a, a position where someone is having IVF and somebody says, you know, okay, well, we now know of um, the sort of genetic underpinnings of behavior and intelligence, and these sorts of things, and we can use this, you know, CRISPR-Cas9 technology to kind of modify the genes in a beneficial way for you, and we can do that, you know, before the embryo is implanted. Um, I think we're kind of a long way off that. I don't think we're potentially ever going to be there where the science is robust enough to actually start being able to do that in a meaningful way. But when you start adding commercialization in, are in a very difficult position because you're having to balance lots of different factors. For example, how you define serious conditions. What's, how do you regulate for the robustness of the science to be used in these technologies? And you know, how do you regulate for the, what, you know, these private companies often operating in different countries? It's really hard to start to, to do. Sarah, do you want to... I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I think what you've also got is you've also got the rise of direct-to-consumer marketing and, you know, not just 23andMe, but again, um, the fertility sector is largely expanding through marketing to people who are fertile, through egg freezing and that sort of technology. So I, I think, I do think it's a very complicated situation and I think that COVID reminds us that there's quite a big gap between you know what could be provided and what is scientifically possible and the ability to deliver that because because we've sort of left out a key stage of you know the the privatization of the NHS and the you know rapid expansion of private medicine and you know IVF was touted by Margaret Thatcher as a perfect example of a new private sector health service and that might have been good in the context of the enterprise culture for you know, a change in the definition of the British economy, but it wasn't great for people's confidence um, in health service. And there's there's a price to that. Um, there's a price to that a move to emphasize the entrepreneurial success of the health sector. It's obviously a very important part of the health sector and of the British health sector, but it's complicated and yeah. there really needs to be a better discussion, a wider ranging discussion about how people will entrust the health services going forward um, and, and how that will happen equitably, you know, as well as ethically. It's clearly an important and exciting conversation because Alison and John both keen to come in. But I, I want to come in um, just for a moment to go back because you, you were saying, so that it's important to think about and understand the conditions that pertained, you know, in, in the, you know, over the last few decades. And you described it as in some sense, very permissive and in some senses quite restrictive. So really, I just wonder if you could spell out why and in what ways was it permissive and why in what ways was it uh, restrictive? And you made the point that this actually, something about the, the kind of regulatory and governance arrangement had won public confidence. And, and, and what was it that was at the heart of that kind of public confidence that, that you see potentially kind of, you know, at risk at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of this is quite circumstantial, but but in the, you know, late 1980s, when the public debate around the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act was really heating up, the, the country was incredibly divided, and there was a majority of opinion against allowing embryo research, and the pro-life lobby in particular was extremely active on both sides of the Atlantic, and you know, the initial expectation was the, the initial vote in relation to um, the recommendations of the Warnock report was 
not to support them. And to get from there to where Mary Warnock eventually got, which was pretty much passage of all of her recommendations without with very little change, took a huge effort by the medical scientific community. And they formed the organization, Progress Educational Trust. It was called Progress, initially it's now called Progress Educational Trust. And they went around to women's institutes, they went all over the country, they talked to people, they met with people, they published articles, and they you know, changed the debate through a dialogue and probably just circumstantially as much as anything else that took, they took a long time. It took a long time to get that through Parliament. Um, you know, large part of the 1980s was spent in that discussion. So we're, so we're in a situation where there is that backdrop of relatively, you might say, stable legislation here in the UK. And when things like mitochondrial donation came up, they went through Parliament pretty quickly with very little discussion, actually, because there is this very sort of stable background that is, I would say, as a social scientist, a symbolic background as much as a literal one, because what it represents to people, what it means to people, is that they can have faith in the system. Whether that is going to stand up going forward is, is going to be something to watch very, very closely, because the 14-day rule, which is the, the centerpiece of that legislation, the 14-day limit on embryo research, will most likely come up for discussion soon. And Mary Warnock, before she died, said, don't bring it up again. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's the anchor. The whole ship's going to drift away if you don't, you know, hold on to the anchor. But on the other hand, you know, she could see it was 20 years old, 30 years old. And, um, you know, the science is moving on. So, so there needs to be a discussion. But that's, I think, where we need to really pay attention here to the social context of this, as well as the scientific context. Yeah, Alison, you wanted, uh, that's very helpful. So, Alison, do you want to come in? I wanted to come in on the direct to consumer angle um, and just really s to say that I think part of the approach here could be um, just ensuring more transparency on the part of the, the companies that are offering testing. Uh, what are their scientific materials that, re that they're relying on? What are the claims they're making? How legitimate are those claims? That could be done through advertising regulation, but also systems of verif verification, validation for the claims that they're making, and also thinking about the impacts of the direct-to-consumer testing then on the NHS, which I'm sure is something that John has an opinion about too. But the interface between the, the private and the public system, I think, it will be crucial going ahead. Yeah, I could just comment on the direct-to-consumer testing as well, because I think it raises a point that's relevant for both... Um, how technology is, 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 you know, marketed, but also I think it also relates back to some of Sarah's point about regulation, which is, is, is language use around genetics. And I think there is a challenge kind of going forward that, that we sort of see cutting across all of, all of these dimensions, which is that genetic language has emerged out of sort of Mendelian genetics. We're talking about single gene disorders, and that's where we're used to talking about it, you know, you know the kind of so-called gene four idea. And I think that's reflected in our public culture um, you know, you know, you, you turn on the TV and you will see an advert where it says, you know, this, this, it's in our DNA. This idea that that genes are not only simple in terms of their causation, but also incredibly powerful and almost kind of, you know, that kind of idea of genetic determinism. How does that? And I think direct to consumer companies use that in terms of their marketing. How do you create a language that is suitable for both encapsulating scientific? understanding so you know you talk to um, Alison about kind of having an advertising standards well you, you know, need to make sure that your language is fit for purpose but also fit for regulatory purpose in a, a language about genetics that encapsulate the increasing complexity with which um, we're you know understanding the way that um, our genes influence our health um, and I think there's an element, element to which our, our, our language at the minute because it's still rooted and I think in quite this kind of you know gene for deterministic language doesn't quite yet encapsulate that complexity um, but it, you know, has these broader meanings that can be very useful for direct to consumer companies, and that's a that's a big challenge. I think a science communication challenge going forward. Thank you, John and Sarah. I mean, the final final question. I mean, they're so I mean, it's so huge the the topic we're left with, <laughs> but we've only got a, we've got less than a minute now. I mean, I don't know what to ask you, Sarah. That it doesn't take us off in in a thousand new directions. Um, I mean, well, maybe, I, maybe I could say, what, I can, what prospects do you see for, I mean, the, the risk I, from, from listening to you, is, all three, is, is the, the prospect of a, 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 a redivision, if you like, a complete kind of cacophony of different views 
which which struggle to sort of come together around a sort of settled position. I mean, that seems to be, from what you're saying, Sarah, uh, uh, something to, to take seriously as a possibility. And I think, I think something to take very seriously is a sociological principle that we've seen over and over again, which is that explaining to people how complicated scientific things are doesn't reduce their trust in them. It increases them. I, I call it the uncertainty principle because you know, PGD is a great example. You know, these couples who come in for PGD, they get told by the clinicians how incredibly difficult it is, you know, and how many things can go wrong. And that increases their trust in the technique because they can tell that people aren't trying to pull one over. The lack of any consumer protection at all in the IVF sector now does the opposite. You know, it, it allows for a gross oversimplification of things to people in a very vulnerable position. And that sends a terrible message to people which is that they're being manipulated. And you know nothing can really do more damage to a sector than that man message. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you all very much, Alison, John, and Sarah. I mean, we've, we've covered, you know, we've touched on some of the technological possibilities. You talked about the regulatory frameworks and the ways in which we can anticipate them being, being challenged. But I think all three of you have agreed that a lot of it comes down to the kinds of conversations that happen between clinicians and patients, between publics and regulators and, and among ourselves is sort of as, as we think about and, and try and process over time the, the the questions that these technologies open up and how we want to live with them. So I think it's really a very helpful and rich discussion. Thank you very much. CSAP's Science and Policy podcast is a production of the Centre for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. The series is hosted by me, Dr. Rob Doubleday, and is produced by Kate McNeil with the support of research assistant Alice Millington. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or by visiting our website at www.csap.cam.ac.uk. If you have any feedback about this episode or questions you'd like to address in the future, please email us at inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. Thanks for listening.